Good morning and welcome to the adult Sunday school class at Freedom's Way Baptist Church. We are still in the book of Ezekiel. Much has happened this past week that many may not be aware of as we're looking at Israel and what is happening with the uh, they are our timepiece for the end times. So things have happened. The Houthis down there in Yemen fired the first for the first time a hypersonic missile to Israel, which hit Israel. They were they didn't defend it, and it landed in a field, so it didn't kill anybody, but the fact that a hypersonic missile was, uh, was fired and not intercepted is kind of interesting. Also this week, if you're not aware, it means it's fast. It's, it's Mach 5 plus. It's faster than Speed Racer, so who was in the Mach 5. So what we have going also is the Hezbollah capers. Israel has been very smart this week. What they did, they booby-trapped their pagers and their walkie-talkies of the mid to upper level Hezbollah folk. And at a certain time, uh, first it was the pagers that went off and 2,700 pagers blew up, either blowing off hands of these upper level uh, Hamas personnel blowing out eyes, and in some cases, 14 people were killed. They, and then immediately Hamas said, oh, they killed children. Well, if a guy was holding his child and looking at his pager and it went off, yes, the child was killed. But, and then uh, Ocasio-Cortez was saying that this is against humanity, booby-trapping things like this because children get hurt. Well, this wasn't destined for children, it was destined for the leaders. Children do get hurt in warfare, there's no such thing as a victimless war that takes place. A lot of people get killed, the innocent, so to speak, get killed, but the children of Hamas and Hezbollah will grow up being Hamas or Hezbollah. So it's, uh, and Muslim, which means they will probably never likely know who God is, Jesus Christ. Also, then the next, very next day, 14,000 of these walkie-talkies blew up, killing a lot more people. 4,000 people were killed in that, in that venture. So a lot of people are saying, bravo, Israel, for thinking of this and killing these, because these are middle to upper managers of Hamas, which devastated a lot of things. So immediately, those that were alive of Hamas launched over 120, 140 missiles against Israel, uh, the northern part of Israel, because their missiles aren't that powerful or go that far. So it fell on all of uh, northern Israel, but a lot of them were destroyed by the Patriot missile systems and those kind of things. And then what happens? Israel flies over and blows up all the remaining launching tubes that Hamas has. So now they're incapable, and oh, by the way, they dropped a precision bomb on a house that killed over 25 members of the Hezbollah leadership. So that destroyed them. And one of the guys that happened to be there, part of this leadership, was the very same guy that planned the 1983 bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. He was also responsible for the killing of 141 Marines at the, uh, at the Marine barracks that was in Beirut at that time. So all of a sudden the United States goes, mm, okay, good job Israel, thank you for avenging us on this guy. So Israel is also looking at possibly invading uh, southern Lebanon at this time and destroying the rest of them. So this is phase two. This is Psalm 83 right before our eyes as they're cleaning out the areas that surround them. And remember, these areas, these uh, Hamas is fenced off. It's a walled protecting against uh, the Gaza Strip area. There's a wall on the northern border. But Israel will destroy that wall in order to get at uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon area. So it's interesting to see what's going on. We're getting close to October 7th, probably in about three weeks, which is the anniversary of the attack on Israel. And Israel is planning on just finishing up Hamas within that year period of time. We're in Ezekiel 34. We got down to uh, uh, verse, uh, 
well, we'll get down to it. We'll get down, we got down to verse 17 this last time, and we've got a little bit to finish up in 34 before we hit 35, which we'll probably hit today. Let's go ahead and start and read down to where we left off in Ezekiel chapter 34 at verse 1. And this deals with the wicked shepherds, both civil leaders and spiritual leaders. Kind of like the United States, if you see what's going on in our government today. Verse 1 of Ezekiel 34 says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And we've talked about this, that they don't take care of the people, but Jesus Christ, and his, he will, and he is the good shepherd. Verse 3 says, Ye eat the fat, ye clothe you with the wool, ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flocks. Verse 4 says, The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought to get again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost. Again, Jesus Christ talks about that in Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 6, how uh, he, being the good shepherd, will leave the 100 and uh, leave the, the 99 and seek the one that is lost. But the force and the cruelty, ye have ruled them. And they, are, they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were, sca when they were scattered. My sheep wander through all the mountains and upon the, every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. And he's talking about the Jews uh, now and after the diaspora and all kinds of stuff where they are scattered throughout the world, uh, scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did seek or search or seek after them. Nobody cared about the Jews. People still don't care about the Jews and what's going on and wish the Jews would be destroyed. Interesting, they have no knowledge that the Jews are still God's chosen people. He is still dealing with them, as you can see what's happening in Israel. Verse 8 says, As I live, saith the Lord, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, Neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. See how God takes it personally about his sheep and his flock? Same thing with the, uh, with the uh, Christian church these days. God cares for Christians. He watches over us. We're part of that flock. Uh, yes, he has the Jews. We're part of a different flock that he talked about we are the other sheep, and yes, we will be, uh, the church will be part of the bride taken up, and those, the Jews that later come to know Jesus Christ after the tribulation period will be part of those that live into the millennial period of time un until the uh, resurrection of all the dead. So here, here we go in verse 9, it says, Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will re require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock, neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they should not be meat for them. So he's going to take care of all the bad guys, both the spiritual leaders and the civil leaders that are not taking care of his people. Verse 11 says, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places. And that's worldwide he's talking about, all places. You know, so he continually says that he is going to be bringing back every single Jew that is alive, that's faithful, to back to Israel. 
And there are a lot of Jews all over. You know, you look at New York that is full of Jews, but these are self-loathing Jews for the most part. A lot of those in, in the movie business and things of this, they, they tolerate being Jews. Oh, look at me. I go to the synagogue. I do this and that. But do they really honor and give of themselves uh, to God? No, they do not. And God knows this because it's these same Jews that hate Israel today. You know, look at a guy like Bernie Sanders. He hates Israel. He hates Jews. And all these other people that are Jews taking care of things, like a pastor talked about, Larry Fink, who's in charge of BlackRock, one of the largest financial groups in the world, who uh, can back loans up to $30 trillion. They have more money in that than the U.S. Treasury, which is not really part of holding money anymore because we have what's called the uh, Federal Reserve, which takes all the money and stuff. So that's the difference. Our money is not in our government. It's in the Federal Reserve Bank, which is not government. It's private. So it's kind of interesting. And I will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark days. So this is the uh, Psalms 23, 24, uh, 22, 23, and 24 are the trilogy of the shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd, the Messiah. And now for verse 13, it says, And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of the river or of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them. See, this is the Lord. He's feeding the flocks. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel, bringing them back home. Sh shall their fold be? There shall they live in a good fold, in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. And this is yet coming. This is like Psalm 23. This is millennial, because this is when Israel will live in the land. Uh, Jesus Christ will be king of the land. And we'll see somebody else who will also be there helping to feed the flocks uh, uh, in uh, the next coming chapters. Verse 15 says, I will feed my flock. I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and I will feed them with judgment. And see here again, you know, if you've got Jewish friends that say, oh, you know, Jesus Christ is not God, you could take them to Psalms 22, 23, and 24, show them the trilogy of who the good shepherd is, read them this portion of uh, Ezekiel in chapter 34 about how God will feed them in good pasture and stuff like that. And then you take them to the New Testament, chapter 10 of John, and show where he claims to be the good shepherd. He doesn't claim, he says, I am the good shepherd. There it is. He is God incarnate telling Israel he will feed them. He is their shepherd, just like he said in the Psalms and here in Ezekiel chapter 34. So how can you, how can you deny that? Here, read this. Get, let, him, let him read it. Here, read, read, read. What does it say? Who is this good shepherd? God? Okay. Now, see what Jesus Christ says. I am the good shepherd. He's God. Boom, right there. So this is what's going on. This is what he says. Verse 15, I will feed my flocks. I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and bind and will bind up that which is broken and will strengthen that which is sick. So he's taking care of all their needs. But I will destroy the fat and the strong I will feed them with judgment. So he's going to be taking care of all the bad shepherds, the wicked shepherds that we're ta talking about. So here in uh, uh, verse 17 it says, As for you, O my flock, his flock, he's 
taking control of it. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle and between rams and the he goats. And that's about where we left off, talking about the differences between cattle being the speckled and spotted and the brown cattle like uh, uh, Jacob did when he was with Laban, where Jacob says, hey, I'll take all the spotted and striped ones. Laban, you can take all the brown. And yet through knowing how God works and uh, how dealing with this, he turned all those speckled and brown, their, or speckled and spotted, all their offspring to brown, and all of Laban's who were brown, all to speckled and spotted. And so Jacob ended, with, ended up with all the cattle eventually that were brown, and all the bad ones were left with Laban, which caused him to be angry after uh, Jacob had taken off. So we left off here at verse 18, and we're going to go ahead and, and open with a word of prayer as we begin this morning's lesson. Blessed Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word here in the book of Ezekiel. Lord, we see that you are the good shepherd. Our Lord God is the good shepherd, and yes, our Lord God is Jesus Christ, who is the good shepherd, who claims, I am the name of God, the good shepherd. Yahweh, the good shepherd, is who uh, we worship and believe in. And Lord, we just pray your hand upon us as we study your word to see that, yes, there are ties between the Old Testament and the New. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And you are revealing yourself through the words that we are reading today because we are students of both. And Lord, watch over our church today, be with pastors as he preaches, and be with our guests tonight. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So we are in verse uh, chapter 34 and beginning with verse 18. As the Lord continues on talking about his flock and his dealing with things. And it'll be interesting that he names somebody else that will be taking place in this in the future. And, it's, it, and some commentaries say that, yes, this is the person that is named, or yes, this person represents Jesus Christ. So in verse 18 of chapter 34, it says, Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture? But ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and have... Uh, and to have drunk the deep waters, but ye must foul the residue with your feet. What he's talking about is normally if you're out in the sheep pastures and stuff, sheep will eat everything to the ground, even the nubs, to where cattlemen used to have sheep wars and cattle wars with shepherds because sheep would destroy the pastures that cattle were in. There'd be no grass left for the cattle once the sheep got through. And never, never, never do you drink a stream that goes through a pasture if sheep or cows are in it because they mess it up by stepping through it and, you know, doing their bathroom business in the same waters that they drink. So you never want to drink anything that goes through a pasture because it's fouled up. So he's talking about having to drunk have to have drunk of the deep waters, but ye must foul the residue with your feet. Why are you stepping in all this? Verse 19, it says, As for my flock, and this is and what we're talking about in 18, is what the false shepherds did. They allowed them to all mix up. So now the Lord is comparing himself. He says, And as for my flock, they eat that which ye have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which ye have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and the lean cattle. It's kind of interesting, this fat cattle and lean cattle was also used in Genesis chapter 41, verses uh, 2 through 4, when Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream, where seven fat cattle came out of the uh, waters, and they ate and stuff like that, and then next seven lean cattle came out, and they ended up eating the fat cattle, and, but they were still lean. And uh, Joseph interpreted this as, hey, you're going to have uh, seven great years of uh, plenty, and you're going to have seven lean years that are going to eat up even the fat that it was there. So let's go ahead and start storing things, you know, so we're prepared for those lean years. And that's something that each of us 
two for emergencies need to have on hand, uh, emergency water and food, because if you're paying attention to what's happening in the world, there's a lot of earthquakes coming. Southern California is overdue for the big one, uh, you know, which used to come every 20 years, but it has, it's been over 20 years, it's been about 30 years since the last one in 94. Yes, we've been having small ones and people say, oh, that's good, we're having pressure relieved. Sometimes it leads up to the big one. Look at what's happening over in Asia, the Pacific Rim. It's cracking all around. There's more vic volcano activity and things of this nature. So just to keep yourself and your family preserved for a while, you need to have some stores, which is a good thing to do. Take, you know, Base that off of uh, Joseph and the fat years and the lean years. Verse 21 says, because ye have trusted with side and with shoulder and pushed all the disease with your horns till ye have scattered them abroad. And now he's going back and talking about the, the bad guys that uh, they have thrusted, basically pushing out God's people, God's flock, and even using horns, pushed all the diseased with your horns. And horns represents power. You know, we'll, we see a lot of that through the book of Daniel and others. Horns represent power. That's, you know, the, the beast with, set, you know, with ten horns and then three are killed. And he's got seven horns. These are power or people that represent power. So, and because horns are the power of a beast. Any beast that has horns you want to steer clear of. And so it, uh, going on, it says... Uh, pushed all the disease with their horns till ye have scattered them abroad. So it's basically, this is what you did to my flock. They're scattered all over the world. Verse 22 says, Therefore will I save my flock, that they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. Again, the uh, speckled and spotted and the brown, because the bad ones have pushed my people out. In verse 23, I will set up one shepherd, one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He will feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Verse 24, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. So a lot of people are confused. If you go through commentaries, some people will say this is actually David, King David, when he's at, in, after the resurrection, when Israel is brought back into the land during the millennial period of time, and all the good Jews are raised from the dead, David will be one of them. David is called here a servant. David, a prince. Well, who's going to be king? Jesus. David will serve as Jesus' servant in this aspect and be an underling under Jesus and follow him because David himself was the shepherd of Israel at the time. Others have said that this, oh, no, no, no. They're just talking about the descendant of David, who is, in fact, Jesus Christ. You have the Lord who is God the Father, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince. David, Jesus Christ, who is the descendant of David. So this is the thing that you get if you read a couple commentaries as to what's going on. And so David, a prince among them, the earth will be the eternal home of Israel, and it appears that David will rule here, this is what one of the commentaries says, will rule here on his earth, on this earth, through eternity, and his seed, which goes back to Psalm 89. Let's take a look at Psalm 89. Keep your finger here. Let's look at Psalm 89. As this kind of brings up something as to what's taking place. Psalm 89 and verse 4 and 5. Psalm 89, verse 4, it says, Thy, Let's start at verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant, there it is, my servant again, thy seed will I establish forever. So it could be the seed of David and build up thy throne 
to all generations. Selah, which talks about Jesus Christ. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Now look down at uh, 89 verse 20 in the same, in the same uh, psalm where it says, I have found David my servant with my holy oil have I anointed him. And you got to remember this psalm is written possibly during the time of David or shortly after the time of David because Psalm 89 was written by Ethan, the Ezraite, which means he could have been from the uh, you know, descendant of Ezra. And also, let's look at verse 29 of Psalm 89 also, where it says, His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. So that's talking about the seed of David, which is Jesus Christ. So that's why there's a lot of confusion as to whether is David coming to come back and is he going to be a servant, a prince, or is this talking about Jesus Christ? So there's a lot of messianic references to Christ as the son of David. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 9. Hosea uh, chapter 3, verse 5. So there's a lot of references to this. David and Jesus are kind of interchangeable because they're both kings. They're both shepherds. So, and, Jesus, and even David in Psalm 110 says, you know, uh, the Lord said unto my Lord. Basically, David's calling the Messiah Lord, even though it's his generation back again. So it's kind of interesting that this is kind of the focus between David and Joseph, or David and Jesus. And we're going to see more of this later on uh, in the next couple chapters because it mentions David again. So verse 25 of Ezekiel chapter 34, where it says, I will make them a covenant of peace. Now this is very interesting, this covenant of peace. The Jews look forward to a covenant of peace. They want peace. Now, if the Jews were to lay down all their arms today in a covenant with the people that surround them and lay down their arms, what would happen to Israel? They'd be dead. They'd be annihilated. Now, if that was to be on the other foot, if there was to be a covenant of peace in Hamas, Hezbollah, the uh, Islamic Jihad and Iran laid down their arms, what would happen? There would be peace. So the Jews want peace. They don't want war, but they're capable of defending themselves in this. So the, they are looking for a covenant of a peace. But it's kind of interesting with these covenants. As I, I looked up a, a couple of things, back in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 11, take a look at this. 1 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. This was a covenant. This was something which kind of kicked off King Saul. Saul, Saul was the first king, well, kind of the first king. If you go back to uh, uh, the book of Judges, Gideon had a son called Abimelech who pronounced himself as king, and he reigned for three years. So Abimelech of the Jews was a reigning king, but not in the line, not the one God anointed. God didn't anoint it. Saul was the first one God anointed from Samuel. He says, hey, go find him a king. This is the guy I'm going to bring to you. But in 1 Samuel chapter 11, here's this guy named Nahash. What does Nahash mean? Nahash means serpent. Serpent. Interesting name for a guy, right? Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against uh, Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us. And this is going to be very similar to what Israel's going to do with the Antichrist. Okay? And this is very interesting. Look at this. Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. This is what they're going to say to the, the Antichrist. And Nahash, the Ammonite, answered them, on 
this condition. He made a condition for this covenant. Will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all your right eyes? Ooh, wow. Thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel? Wow. Say, hey, the thing you want, if you want peace, you've got to take out your right eye. Is that a good deal? Nope. But see, this very in, it's very interesting because that's something the Antichrist is going to want them to do. Hey, put this chip in your hand or on your forehead and uh, you will make this covenant. And it's also interesting that there's pictures of this idol, I-D-O-L, servant or shepherd in Zechariah that he will have a withered right arm and a blind right eye. Interesting stuff. So as Israel blew up these guys, these Hamas guys, with their pagers, many of them lost their right hand and blew out their eyes. Interesting stuff. Hey, is it all coming together? Scripture is here. It's wide open for us. So this is what's going on. And then let's take a look at uh, Daniel chapter 29, or Jap Daniel cha chapter 9. As we take a look at this, this is another instance of a covenant. And this is the Antichrist who is uh, getting this covenant. This is Daniel chapter uh, uh, 29, verse 27. Uh, uh, 9, there is no 20, 29. It's Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. And he, this is the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, seven years. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So in the midst, he's going to stop allowing the Jews to do sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament because this seven-year period is Old Testament times. They will be offering sacrifice in the temple just like they did in the Old Testament. So he's going to stop it. And why in the midst period? Because that's when he sets up his idol, the image of the beast at this time and what is this also so let's look at isaiah chapter 28 because this is also leading to what it takes place isaiah chapter 28 and ver start at verse 14 isaiah 28 and start at 14 down to verse 18 because this deals with this seven year period Wherefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, ye scornful men. God's not liking these guys. That rule this people, the Jews, which is in Jerusalem. So already, he's already called these guys, these false shepherds that we're looking at here, these wicked shepherds, both spiritually and uh, civilly, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell. And we... Uh, and are we at agreement with the over when the overflowing scourge shall pass through? It shall not come upon us, for we have made lies our refuge under falsehood. Have we hid ourselves? So they're making this covenant with the Antichrist, and any other wars going on at that time will not affect Israel because they'll be under the protection of the Antichrist, whether that's the United States or some other power at that time. They think, hey, we're safe. Iran can't touch us. No other nation can touch us because we're under the umbrella of this. We made a covenant with this false Christ guy. And it's also interesting because this is part of it. Verse 16 where it says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, and, the, and this third temple will it be exist, existing. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. Who's this? This is Jesus Christ. So you have this seven-year period, and yet Jesus Christ comes into the middle of this. In, in this overall, this could be uh, pre-Old Testament. Now we step into New Testament here in verse 16, because Jesus Christ is the foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, that he that believeth shall not make haste. Do we believe in Jesus Christ as our shepherd, our cornerstone? Absolutely. So we are here kind of protected from what's going on. 
Verse 17 says, and Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness with the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding places. So something is coming to take care of this Antichrist now. And it says, And your covenant with death, which goes back to verse 15, shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge, which is the Antichrist, shall pass through then ye shall be trodden down by it. So all this takes place, and this is where the two-thirds of all Jews living in the world will be destroyed, and only one-third of the Jews will be left after all this takes place through the tribulation period, which when Jesus Christ comes as the new Joshua to remove the people from Petra across the Jordan River back into Israel. And it's, you know, the book of Joshua explains all of that as to what's going on. So let's get back here to where we are in uh, verse 25 of Ezekiel uh, chapter 34. As it says, I will make with them a covenant of peace, but this is our Lord God who does this, and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land because he's going to destroy them. And they shall dwell safely. Interesting. This is number one, dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And then verse 26 says, I will make them and the places around about my hills a blessing and will cause the showers to come down in a season and there shall be showers of blessing. Oh, I think we've got a song called Showers of Blessing, right? This is where they get it from. And this is also kind of a picture of the Jews being protected during the tribulation period because they're out of the land, they're being protected by God himself, that they're being blessed in the hills, and there will be showers of blessing, there will be fruit and everything. God's taking care of them for this last three and a half year period. And it looks like in uh, verse 27 where it says, And the tree of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield their increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord. This is all taking place as protection, and also getting back into the land. The Lord will take care of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen. No more, because he's taking care of it. Neither shall the beast of the land devour them. No more. All those evil Jews, those self-loathing Jews who hate Israel, who supplant them, their religious leaders who are feeding them false information, will be done away with because, because the Lord is taking care of them. He's bringing them back, and they will recognize Jesus Christ, the one whom they have pierced from Zechariah chapter 12, 10. They'll see Jesus Christ. And now it says... It, it says, Neither shall the beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely. There it is, the second time they're told that they will dwell safely. And none shall make them afraid. And it's kind of interesting that uh, there are three times none shall dwell safely, because that the second, three more times in uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, we'll see dwelling safely. And none shall make them afraid. And I will, verse 29, raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. So they'll be all pulled out of the land. They'll be all taken back to Israel. And, the, and verse 30 says it again, Thus shall they know that I, the Lord, their God am with them. Because they don't know that yet. They still don't know that it is Jesus Christ's hand that watches over them. And that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men. And I am your God, saith the Lord God. So yes, he's calling them out, saying, hey, I am it. So now we move into chapter 35. We'll take a quick look at what's happening in, 
in chapter 35 because 35 deals again with Edom. Yeah, we dealt with Edom a couple chapters ago, but now we're dealing with them again. The present oracle, much more detailed than in Ezekiel chapter 25, verses 12 through 14, was called forth by Edom's hostile behavior to Judah after, this is after the destruction of Jerusalem takes place. Israel must be clear cleared of hostile neighbors before blessings of the new age begin. So this is dealing again from past to present, what we're looking at. What is Israel doing today? Cleaning out the people around them. Hamas is next, or Hezbollah is next. Hamas is already almost done with. They've just got a little bit of cleanup to do, but Hezbollah is raising their ugly head and they've been taking care of them by destroying their leadership and things and destroying all their missile launchers. So it's kind of interesting. What can Hezbollah mount now against Israel? Not much. And Israel will have an easier time cleaning them out as to what's going on. So the desolation of Mount Seir, which is Edom, the south end of the Dead Sea area, and the restoration of the mountains of Israel uh, form a striking contrast here in in this first part where it says, Verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 35, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it. And Mount Seir means hairy, covered with brushwood. So it's it's a place where uh, uh, Esau went to, who was also known as hairy and red. Uh, so it's all related to him, the brother of Jacob the cousins of the Jews, and say unto them, in verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and will make thee most desolate. And again, this is also repeated in Obadiah, verse 18. Obadiah is one chapter, basically, and it's all against Edom. And verse 18 talks about the destruction of Edom the south end of the Dead Sea area. And I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel has previously mentioned uh, Edom's judgment in Ezekiel 25, verses 12 uh, through 14. Petra and Teman were the main cities of Edom. And just as the prophecy had indicated, they are now in ruins and much of it is in ruins in that south end anyway. Edom was uh, subjugated by uh, Babylonia also, then by the Medo-Persians. And in 126 BC, the Hesmoneans uh, compelled them to become Jews. So they kind of formed up, and that's how Herod came into power. The family of Herod were Hesmoneans. They were part Jews. They claimed Jews, but they weren't real Jews. So that's how he was able to come into power. And he hated the Jews. Verse 5 says, Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. So God is judging them for killing the Jews after the Babylonians had struck them. Those that remained, those that were scattered, the the, uh, Edomites sought out the Jews and still killed them. The Lord doesn't forget these things. Therefore, he says, when you see therefore, you want to see what it's there for. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, and this is the promise he's making, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee, sith or since thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut off from it him that passeth out, and him that returneth. So it's kind of interesting that blood was used four times in those two verses. And this deals with blood being red, and Edom also means red. So it's dealing with that aspect of things. 
So verse 8 says, And I will fill his mountains with the slain men in thy hills and in thy valleys and in all thy rivers. They shall fall that are slain with the sword. So he's not cutting any corners. He's going to deal with them. Verse 9, I will make thee perpetual desolation, and thy cities shall not return, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So he's going to destroy that. And that's why this Edom area that is all desolate these days will be the hiding place for the Jews. It's owned by Jordan. It's part of Jordan. But that's going to be the hiding place of the Jews in Petra, in that area. When the Antichrist comes in Jesus Christ in, in, uh, in uh, Matthew 24 says, Hey, when you see the abomination of desolation as spoken by Daniel, flee. It means take off. Don't stay, oh, i got to get my bag, got to get my go bag and all this. Just flee with what's ever on your body and go. The Lord will take care of you down there. He promised. He was saying he will. That he's the good shepherd. He'll take care of his people. Because that's the one third that will be fleeing. The rest of them will be, ah, I'm not worried about what's happening. You know, I, I like the Antichrist. He's going to bring wealth and, and, and welfare to our, our nation. And those are the Jews that will be destroyed. So this is the hiding place that's being prepared. Verse 10, because thou hast said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. So the two nations talked about are Israel and Judah. And Edom's thought, hey, once Babylon destroys this land, destroys Judah, destroys Jerusalem, we're going to inhabit the area. We're going to take it over. The Jews are gone, so this will be the land of Edom afterwards. But God doesn't like that. He takes care of it. Verse 11 says, Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy. As you were angry, as you were envious, I'm going to be taking care of you. Which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them, against the Jews. And I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. Hey, things are coming to you and you're going to know that I am the Lord. That's a promise. And they shall know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Yay, let's go get them, guys. Israel's gone. Let the Edomites take over. Thus with your mouth ye have boasted against me. Oh, shouldn't do that. And having multiplied your words against me, I have heard them. The Lord hears everything. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what you're thinking. He knows your jokes and stuff when you kid around. <laughs> yeah, we're going to take care of those Jews. Yeah, yeah. He, he keeps score on all this. Verse 14 says, Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate, as thou didst rejoice in the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Edomia, even all of it. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So he's taking care of them. And it's kind of interesting, too, because, you know, looking real quick, and we'll finish here with this. Jesus is the one who is mighty to save. And this is linked to Revelation 19. But we also have to remember what is said in Isaiah chapter 63, verses 1 through 4. And, and this is exactly what's happening at the end time when he leads them back. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Isaiah 63, 1 through 4. With dyed garments from Basra. What do you mean dyed? Jesus is usually uh, clothed in white linens. But now it's all spotted. What's it spotted with? It looks like dyed. And it explains, This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Nobody's going to stand in his way. That I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And this is Jesus talking. Wherefore, and this is going back. Wherefore art thou red in thy garments? He's got red all along the bottom of his white uh, clothing. And thy garments, like him that treadeth in the wine fat, I have trodden, 
This is Jesus speaking. Trodden the winepress alone. And of the people, there was none with me. He's by himself. Who needs to be with Jesus? Nobody. He can do it himself. For I will tread them in mine anger and tread them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garment and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart and the year of my redemption is come. And this is the separation between Isaiah chapter uh, 61 verses 1 and 2. And it's, this is where Jesus read in Luke chapter 4 verses 17 through 21. And where he closed a period after year of the Lord. Because he left out for the day of vengeance is mine. But that is yet to come. That is yet future. His first coming was to save humanity from their sins. The next one is to stomp them like grapes. And boy, is he mad. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Blessed Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we can study your word, that we thank you for your awesomeness, that you are. You came as gentle as a lamb your first time, but you're going to be a roaring lion your second time. You're going to take care of evil in the land, your land, Israel. Those that are attacking it today, Lord, you're going to take care of. Those that are in the land that are evil and wicked shepherds, you will take care of them, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that we can be observers from heaven, that you take us out during all this time. And Lord, we just uh, pray your hand upon Israel. We pray your hand upon this church this morning as we preach your word. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So next for next week, we'll be in 36, chapter 36, which also talks about is, the reason for Israel's restoration and the things to come. And then we get into the Valley of the Dry Bones in 37.